And we've started our uh, study of uh, Abraham. Let, let's kind of do a bit of a, of a review here just to, you know, to kind of get us focused on this book. We know about Abram, you know, I, I keep going back between Abram and Abraham, it's the same person, obviously his name was changed, but uh, he was a descendant of Shem from that lineage, one of Noah's sons, Shem. Uh, he was from Ur, a city uh, in ancient Babylon, and, which is modern day Iraq. Uh, we found out that his father Terah was called by God to leave that city Ur and go to the land of Canaan. Uh, which is, of course, Israel. And we also found out that his father made it to Haran, which was north of Ur, on the way, if you wish, to, uh, to Canaan. Uh, but he died there in that city. And then another call, apparently, to Abram to continue that journey. You know, you know, I was thinking about that today. You know, two, two generations to fulfill God's call. Sometimes you know, the parents do push ahead in one area and the children kind of move the, the ball down the field. You know. So two, two generations there. Uh, he lived in the land. He went to Egypt for a while during the famine. We, we, found, we read about him being expelled from Egypt because of a deception concerning his wife. But while he was there, he, um, he grew rich. Uh, and he and his nephew Lot separated um, you know, their herds and their people uh, because they were so wealthy, they were taking up a lot of the grazing land and so on and so forth. And Lot chose to settle in the Jordan Valley near the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, and Abram remained in the mountainous uh, regions. So we've also learned about God's promises or covenants with uh, Abraham. So that's a you know, little history of Abraham. And then all the promises that God has made to Abram, that he would be a great nation, or a great nation would come from him, that he would be a great man, that through him many would be blessed. Uh, God offered his protection, his special protection of him, uh, that further down the line in history, there would be a worldwide blessing that would come through his people, there would be a uh, multiple, uh, multiplicity of descendants, more than they could count. And you need to understand in those times, the concept of life after death was not as it is today. In those days, they didn't have a very developed concept of what happens after death. You know, for most of them, when you died, you died. The best case scenario, I mean the most uh, evolved thought about life after death was that you lived on through your children somehow. Your spirit was in your children. So the, the promise that you would have many descendants was almost like saying, you're going to you know, have eternal life. So today when you say eternal life, we have something completely different that we think about, don't we? We think I am going to be conscious, I'm going to be myself, I'm going to know who I am, but I'm going to be living in another dimension. I'm going to exist in another dimension called heaven and I will know who I am and I will know who God is and you know, that we have that concept. Uh, we didn't make that up, obviously. The Bible teaches us that, but there's this thing called progressive revelation through the Bible and, and the idea of progressive revelation is simply that God reveals Himself and He reveals His plans and He reveals ideas you know, progressively. Okay? Uh, with each new prophet, with each new revelation, we get more and more uh, a, a better concept of who God is, what His will is, and in the area of life after death, we get more information about what life will be like. I mean, you read about, you read about how Paul describes life after death in 1 Corinthians 15, you know, and he talks about you know, a seed is planted and then when it grows up, the, the, you know, the plant doesn't look anything like the seed, you know? and then he makes the comparison. Same thing with us. When we die, our body is planted, if you wish, in the earth, uh, and then what we come back as is very different. It doesn't look anything like you know, what we planted. So we have this idea of progressive revelation where God gives us more information as time goes on. But as far as Abram or Abraham was concerned, the idea that he would have many descendants was a marvelous promise to him. And it makes you understand 
what a tremendous sacrifice it was that he was ready to sacrifice his son. It was almost like giving up you know, his, his hope for life after death. You know, tremendous sacrifice. Anyway, so that was one of the promises. And of course, the possession, the here and now promises that one day your, your family, your, your descendants would own the land or have the land. So all of these promises begin to kind of melt into one single promise as time goes on. And ultimately, all of these promises find their true fulfillment in a spiritual nature through Jesus Christ the promised one. So in our lesson today, we're going to look at another great test of Abram's faith and meet a very unusual figure in Old Testament history. So let's uh, talk about the war here uh, in verses uh, 1 to 12. We're not going to read that right away. It seems that for a time Abram lived in relative peace and prosperity, and then a war broke out in the region where he was living. Apparently there was a group of five city-states, each with their own kings, scattered in the Jordan Valley, of which Sodom and Gomorrah were two of those cities. Remember, they call them kings, you know, but when we hear king, we think of you know, the king of England or the queen of England, pomp and circumstance. You, know, you could almost say chief, you know, very tribal. So a king was the leader of a particular group, but we're not talking necessarily about you know, millions and millions of subjects. You know. Local chieftains, if you wish, local kings. So these five were in subjection to a powerful northern king called Kedarle Omur. It's a hard word to say, Kedarle Omur, who ruled with the help of other local northern chieftains. So these, these city-states, if you wish, these chieftains, these kings were always at war with uh, one another. And what was happening is this arrangement of paying tribute to the northern kingdom, that worked for about a dozen years. It was just simply extortion, that's all. You, know, you pay us taxes or else we go kill you. you know, a, simple, a simple bargain. You know? uh, so for 12 years they did this. But as the Bible says, in the 13th year, the five kings in the valley revolted. They refused to pay any more money uh, to the northern kings or to submit. So this provokes an attack by the northern king and his allies. And so the verses 1 to 11 describe all the cities and towns the northern kings destroyed on his way south. And the reason he's doing that is he's destroying all the towns on his way south because he doesn't want anybody to attack him from the rear. You know, he's on his way down to destroy these particular ones here, but on the way down he destroys everybody else. Okay? So finally he arrives in the valley and he totally defeats the five valley kings and during the looting and the pillaging they take Lot, Abraham's nephew, and his property and they make off with them. So Lot was now living in Sodom but somehow he remained a righteous man. We read about him in 2 Peter in the New Testament chapter 2 verse 8 where it says that his righteous soul was grieved you know, by the things that were going on around him. You know, so he was a righteous man living in a very wicked, uh, wicked place. And so God would not allow him to be taken prisoner. So now we'll get to our uh, portion of scripture that I want to read. Chapter 14, beginning in verse 13. It says, Then a fugitive came and told Abram the Hebrew. Now he was living by the oaks of Mamre, uh, the Amorite, brother of Eshcol and brother of Aner, and these were allies with Abraham. When Abram, uh, with Abram rather, when Abram heard that his relative had been taken captive, he let out his trained men, born in his house, 318, and he went in pursuit as far as Dan. He divided his forces against them by night and his servants and defeated them and pursued them as far as Hobah, which is north of Damascus. He brought back all the goods and also brought back his relative Lot with his possessions and also the women and the people. So Abram finds out about the war and the capture of his nephew and he prepares his men for battle. He's a chief too. You know, he's, he's, he's a chief. He's referred to as Abram the Hebrew, notice. And Hebrew at that time meant certain things. First of all, it meant one who came beyond the river, beyond the Euphrates, as a way to distinguish him from the Canaanites. 
So beyond the, you know, the northern part was the Euphrates River. So they knew he came from beyond, you know, he came from, here's the river, and he came from over here. So he came like this across the river and down. So the Canaanites would refer to him as the one from beyond the river. Okay? That's where the idea of Hebrew comes from. Also, he was a descendant of Eber, who had many descendants among Arab tribes. Hebrew, Eber, you see the connection? And then also um, the reference was to a moving tribe, a way to refer to any group of nomads at the time. So the word Hebrew evolved, eventually it came to refer exclusively to the descendants of Abram. So at first it was just a way of referring to him as someone who came from a different place, who was a nomadic in, in his uh, existence and so on and so forth, but eventually it stuck and so all of his relatives, uh, descendants rather, were referred to as Hebrews. He also was a chieftain, he was also a chieftain capable of mobilizing a good number for battle, but he was certainly outnumbered by the northern kings. His strategy was surprise, his strength was from the Lord, and like Gideon and David, he won a great victory on that day. And you know, it doesn't go into a lot of details how they did things, you know, we just know that he won. There's no mention of this battle in ancient records, but we need to remember that pagan kings never described their defeats. So if you, if you study you know, the history of pagan kings, pagan kings, you know, they always had a lot of description about their wonderful victories, you know, but there was very little about their, or nothing about their defeats, and that's nothing new. Revisionist history continues yet to this day, right? So even you know, Second World War, the guilty parties in the Second World War, slowly but surely, like Japan, for example, you know, slowly but surely are changing and expunging from the history books some of their worst atrocities. So you know, revising history is nothing, nothing new. It's been going on for a long time. All right, so after the victory, we have the appearance of one of the most unusual persons in the Bible, a character or a person called Melchizedek. So let's read verse 17. It says, then after his return from the defeat of Kedor Laomer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shaveh, that is, the king's valley. So here we see that Abram's victory was not merely over one band of men who were guarding Lot, but over an entire, entire army and the king himself. So this was a, a, a particularly great victory in the region and it was made possible by God's, you know, God said, I'll protect you. So he said, I'll protect you. And so he protected him, not only if he was attacked, but also protected him in his effort to defeat Lot's uh, captors. So we keep reading in verse 18, it says, and Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine, how significant, now he was a priest, now, it says now he was a priest of God most high. So the term Melchizedek uh, means king of righteousness. His title was king of Salem, which means king of peace. And most scholars are convinced that, that this early city called Salem became Jerusalem. You see it? Okay. Jerusalem. Okay. He was a priest of the Most High Gods. How interesting that is. Which means that somehow, and we don't know how, he worshiped the same God that Abram worshiped and was recognized as a priest to God even by Abram at the time. Remember, this is long before Aaron became, was appointed priest and the the Aaronic priesthood began and, and all the rules for the priests and so on and so forth. This is way, 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 hundreds of years before this, you have an individual recognized as a priest of the Most High God. And we know that animal sacrifice was practiced because you know, Cain and Abel, you know, animal sacrifices uh, were practiced at the time. And so he provides bread and wine either as a form of worship, sacrifice, or as a form of nourishment for Abram and his men. If it was simply nourishment, it meant he was rich. You know, to be able to provide food for you know, three, four hundred people meant that you were a wealthy person at the time. So let's keep, let's keep reading. It says, he blessed him, meaning Melchizedek blessed 
Abram, verse 19, he blessed him and said, blessed be Abram of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. So Melchizedek blesses Abram, which means that he and Abram both accepted his higher position because always the greater blesses the lesser in that society, even in this society today, but especially in that society, you sought the blessing of someone greater, your father or the patriarch you know, would offer the blessing upon, the king would give blessing to the people, the priest would give a blessing or offer the blessing over the people who were, were worshiping. He also uses a proper reference to God. In other words, the, the writer of this episode here quotes Melchizedek as using the proper term for God. Not, not a pagan God, but the God most high. Showing that he understands God's true nature and does not accept the pagan gods around which he lives. So Abraham was not alone as a believer in the true God. Okay? He lived in a country where there were pagans everywhere and they worshiped nature gods and so on and so forth but Melchizedek demonstrates that he's not one of them. He also shows that he is aware of Abram's promises from God and he also shares his hope. Very interesting, verse 20. It says, and blessed be God most high who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And then it says, he gave him, meaning Abram gave to Melchizedek a tenth, a tenth of all. So he offers praise and thanksgiving to God, recognizing that God is the one who has obtained the great victory through Abram, as simply reflecting uh, the truth of the situation that Abram understood, but now Melchizedek, Melchizedek understands this as well. And then it says, um, Abram gives a tithe or a portion of all the spoils to Melchizedek. So this is a mark of respect and submission and agreement. So the appearance of this person and what he does kind of brings up several points. It's like you know, Abram goes out, fights a battle, gets Lot back, in all, and in all of this action, you know, the writer drops this scene here, like a little scene, you know, a separate scene, a close-up. Remember the big picture and the close-up? This little close-up between Melchizedek, this unusual high priest person, and, and, and Abram. Okay? And there's a reason for this. First of all, we see that what we have in the Bible is not the sum total of all of God's work with man. We don't know everything that Abram did. We don't know everything that Isaac did. We don't know everything that Jacob did. We don't know everything that Jesus did. Now the Bible contains all the reliable information about these people, but it doesn't contain all the information concerning these people. We, we have enough. We have enough to know about God. We have enough to build our faith. We know enough to be saved, of course, and be godly. But we don't have all of the information about everything. So Melchizedek was a priest. He worshiped the true God. He was recognized as such by Abram, but the Bible doesn't say how he got there. That's the thing, we don't know. Where did he get, where did he come from? Did he worship in a temple? Was he the priest? Did he offer sacrifice? Were they friends? We don't know that. He just kind of pops in and pops out. You know? Fascinating, fascinating thing. Now, Melchizedek is a type of Christ as a high priest. I want to explain that sentence. God uses what I call the billboard method in order to teach us. A lot of ways to teach us, you know, through miracles, through teachings, right, commands, so on and so forth. But He also uses this method called billboard. Um, he will announce or He will billboard what is coming ahead and He'll do it in a variety of ways. The example that I give is when, when our kids were young and we were traveling between Montreal and you know, Oklahoma, going to school, stuff like that. We got to a certain point, and I forget where it is now, it's been a long time since I did that north-south route, but you got a sign that said Miramac Caverns, right? Miramac Caverns, 70 miles, you know, and then maybe 15 miles later, 
Miramac caverns, you know, restaurant, souvenir, you know, 40 miles. You know, and then as you got closer, the billboards were like every three miles. And the, you know, turn here, next right. You know, and then there was even one that says, you've passed the, <laughs> you've passed the exit. Turn around you know, to go to Miramac. So that's billboarding. You know, you're not there, it tells you what's ahead. Okay. So God does the same thing. He billboards, but He does it in a variety of ways. For example, He will promise or He will warn about something that may be coming. For example, He warned about the forbidden fruit in Genesis 2. You know, if you disobey, you'll be punished. If you obey, you'll be rewarded. In Genesis 3, he promised, he didn't warn, but he promised that the woman, the seed of woman, would eventually destroy the seed of Satan. You know, he, prom he, he, he makes a promise. Uh, in the flood, he warns. You know, he warns the people something bad's going to happen. You know, he, te he, he tells uh, Noah to start building a, a warning. They have 120 years, but it's a, it's a billboard. You know? uh, and then the rainbow, that's a promise. You know, when you see this, it's a promise that I will not destroy the entire earth. So, so that's one way that he billboards, either with a promise or a warning. Another way that he billboards is by sending a prophet to teach or to warn or to encourage or to announce. For example, Jeremiah came along and he told the people that they would be in captivity for 70 years, you know, sometime in the future if they didn't repent. You know, so he sent the prophet to give a message. That was a billboard. John the Baptist, you know, his billboard was like the Miramac cavern that says, exit now. You know? Well, John the Baptist was a billboard that said, all those promises in the past, they're going to be fulfilled now. Get ready now. The kingdom is here. Okay? So that's another way that God billboards. Another way is He provides a type. Okay? A type is a person or a thing or an event that resembles or personifies something that will come in the future. It helps the people to become familiar with a person or an idea before it actually comes on the scene. All right? So for example, the ark. The ark was a type for the church. And I remember the lesson when we did the lesson for the ark, you know, we showed all the similarities between the ark and there's, you know, there's only one way in to the ark. If you're in the ark, you're safe. If you're out of the ark, you're lost. You know, well, if you're in the church, you're safe. If you're out of the church, you're lost. So the, the ark was a type for the church. Animal sacrifice. You know, people say, well, what was the point of killing all those animals? God doesn't care about animals, blah, 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 blah. You know, well, yeah, the point was, God was billboarding way ahead of time the way that He would take care of man's sins, the vicarious atonement of Jesus. Sacrifice, sacrifice was a type. So animal sacrifice was a type for Jesus' sacrifice. The uh, Jewish experience, their enslavement, their liberation, the wilderness wandering, the promise of the land, you know, the promise of the land of promise, all that experience, what was it? Well, it was a type for the, for the Christian experience. The journey that we make from lostness to salvation, through faithfulness to final glorification in heaven. You know? So the experience of the Jews, why do we read about the Jews? Why do we go through the Old Testament for these stories? Because they're types. We find out how God the Father deals with people. And most specifically the Jews, and so it tells us how He will deal with us. All right? The promised land, well that's an easy one, you know, a type for heaven. And of course, you know, we talked about prophets. Elijah the prophet, he was a type for John the prophet, or John the Baptist as a prophet. Okay? So the point I'm making here with all of this is that Melchizedek is also a type, but a very specific and special type. He is the type for the eternal priesthood of Jesus Christ. All, everything I've said so far is leading up to that particular sentence right there. I'll repeat it again. Melchizedek is the type 
for the eternal priesthood of Jesus Christ. Now someone would say, well, why isn't Aaron the type? After all, Aaron, we know a lot about him, we know about his family, we know about his sister, we know about you know, uh, his experiences, and so on and so forth. Why isn't Aaron the type? Well, Aaron, Moses' brother, he was a priest. He was appointed by God and he served as a type and a model for all the priests who offered animal sacrifices under the law of Moses. So he was a type for those people. But Aaron was not a good model to serve as a type to billboard the coming of Jesus and his work as a high priest, offering not animals as a sacrifice, but himself. Why? Well, Aaron was sinful, so he's not a good type for Christ. Aaron was weak and would eventually die, so he's not a good type for Christ. Aaron had to continually offer sacrifice each and every day for the people and once a year for himself and the people, so he was not a good type for Christ. So the Old Testament needed a better type to prefigure the role of Jesus as the high priest, needed a type that was perfect, a type that was eternal, a type that was superior. So God was not going to prefigure or to serve as a type for himself, so Melchizedek is the one that serves as his type. So now I'm going to ask you to go to Hebrews chapter seven to explain this, okay? Because you'll say, well, wait a minute, you know, Melchizedek, if Melchizedek was a man, well, he certainly wasn't perfect, and if he was a man, he certainly, you know, like all men, died, and if he was a man, he had, you know, he had weaknesses and so forth. Why him? So let's go to Hebrews chapter seven and let's find out why. Hebrews, excuse me, explains how this is so. Like I said, he's only a man, but the way the Old Testament describes him allows him to carry the cloak of the eternal high priest who would come later. So in verses one and two we read, for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the most high God, who met Abraham as he was returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham apportioned a tenth part of all the spoils, was first of all, by the translation of his name, king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, which is king of peace. So first of all, the, the titles that the Bible gives him, king of righteousness and king of peace, will ultimately be fulfilled by Jesus. So in the Old Testament, the writers through the uh, agency of the Holy Spirit refer to him as the king of righteousness and the king of peace. All right? And so because of that, he's a good type to point towards Christ who, is, who will actually be the king of righteousness, who will actually be the king of peace. All right, let's keep going, verse three. Without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, he remains a priest perpetually. Well, did Melchizedek actually not have a mother and father? Well, of course not. Was he an eternal being? Well, uh, of course not. Uh, we know that he wasn't that, he was, he was just a man. But the fact that the word doesn't mention his genealogy doesn't mean that he doesn't have one. It simply means that his appearance in the Bible is presented in such a way to suggest eternity. You see what I'm saying? You have to kind of read between the lines. Again, when the Christ comes, this appearance of immortality suggested by Melchizedek, who is the type, will become a reality for the true high priest. You see? So Jesus is going to be an eternal being. How do you, how do you kind of prefigure that? Well, you present a character in the Bible without giving any of his genealogy, without saying to anyone or explaining to anyone where he came from, without describing when he died. You just allow him to appear out of nowhere and then disappear. So in the way he's presented, okay, he's presented as if he has no beginning or end, as if he's an eternal being. Why? Because we needed a model who would accurately portray the fulfillment. We know that Jesus is an eternal being. We know that He is divine. So you, you get the point I'm trying, to, I'm trying to get across here. All right, let's read the last part in Hebrews. 
So now observe how great this man was to whom Abraham the patriarch gave a tenth of the choicest spoils. And those indeed of the sons of Levi who receive uh, the priest's office have commandment in the law to collect a tenth from the people, that is, from their brethren, although these are descendants from, um, from Abraham. So the fact that Abram, the father of the Jews, paid tithes to Melchizedek shows that he was greater than Abraham. In the same way, the high priest who is after the type of Melchizedek is also greater than the high priest who are the descendants. He's trying to show here in Hebrews that Melchizedek, the type, pointed to a type of high priest that Jesus would become who would be greater than Aaron, greater than the existing priests at the time. Okay? So Melchizedek prefigures or billboards or educates us in advance about the special high priestly position that Christ would fulfill that no other priestly type in the Old Testament could actually do. So today, you know, we've got hindsight, we're looking back and we have the advantage of the book of Hebrews. And the writer of Hebrews actually explains clearly you know, why Melchizedek is there. But can you imagine before the book of Hebrews was written, the scholars who were, you know, the rabbis who were studying the Old Testament and they would stumble across this scene here, Melchizedek. How to make sense of Melchizedek? Who is this guy? So now the writer of Hebrews comes along and says, okay, now that Jesus has been revealed, you know, in the resurrection, so on and so forth, now that Jesus has been revealed, we now understand who Melchizedek was and why he was there. You see, now we see that billboard pointing us to, uh, to Jesus Christ. All right, so let's uh, keep reading. We, we'll flip back to, um, we'll flip back to uh, Genesis. It says, the king of Sodom said to Abram, give the people uh, to me and take the goods for yourself. And Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have sworn to the Lord God most high, poss um, a possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take a thread or a sandal thong or anything that is yours for fear you would say, I have made Abram rich. I will take nothing except what the young men have eaten and the share of the men who went with me, Anur, Eshkol, and Mamre. Let them take their share. So the rest of the chapter sees the king of Sodom, who also has been saved by Abram, because one of the local kings was saved by Abram's action. Um, give him a reward. But Abram has learned his lesson about being rich at the hand of pagan kings. He got rich in Egypt, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Through, through the, the, the king, through the Pharaoh there, he's learned his lesson taking money from the pagan kings. You know? So he, said, he refuses. He said, give the spoils to the men, but as far as I'm concerned, no thank you. Uh, so in this way, what he does actually is give God the complete glory for the victory and the blessings that he has received, which was to save his nephew and now establish peace in the land with the pagan kings. The pagan kings who are there are not going to bother him anymore. Why? Because he's, he's saved them, he's helped them. And so he's a kind of a local hero now. And they also recognize his power. If they were thinking in the past, wow, this guy is rich, he's got a lot of stuff, maybe we ought to go over there and take some of it. You know? Now they're recognizing maybe we better not mess with this guy because he's just wiped out the northern kings. Uh, we need to give him some respect. Okay, so that's as far as we're going to go. Uh, just a couple of lessons here that we, um, that we can draw from this particular uh, passage. Um, always flee from evil, that's one of the basic things. Paul says, Paul the Apostle says, bad company corrupts good morals, 1 Corinthians 15:33. And then in 1 Thessalonians 5.22 he says, abstain from every form of evil. I remember when our kids were small and they wanted to do things that weren't necessarily you know, stealing or anything like that, but it was just worldly, you know, it was just worldly. And uh, I used to quote this passage to them and you know, the, they would argue, oh, it's not so bad, our friends are going, everybody knows it, blah, 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 let's not be like this and this and that. And then I quote this passage here and they say, ah, oh, no fair, you're using the, the Bible. You know, so, yeah, oh, yeah, the Bible, sure, Dad. You know, but as they grew up, they understood the idea of holiness and 
the appearance of holiness. So when we hang around with trouble, trouble will hang around with us, of course. And if we associate ourselves with troublemakers, they will eventually make trouble for us. And the point I'm making here is that, that Lot would have avoided the trouble he was in if he would have stayed away from these evil cities, but he didn't and he got caught up in their turmoil. So yeah, he felt bad inside because he was a righteous man, but he's the one that moved from the country into Sodom itself. So you know, he's, paying, he's paying the price. My point here is we need to aggressively avoid people and places and activity where evil reigns and trouble is part of the, is part of the norm. You know? Flee from evil. Lesson number two, destroy evil, don't delight in it. So we need to avoid evil, but not shirk our responsibility to combat evil and help those who are trapped by it. In other words, we need to stand up for what's right. You know, there's a big difference between watching, associating with, participating in evil, and standing up to it, and judging it, and removing it. The difference between destroying evil and delighting in evil is deciding which side you're on. So, Christians flee from evil as a pleasure, but are not afraid to confront it in order to displace it with good and with right. I remember a long time ago when we lived in Montreal, we had a pharmacy, you know, local pharmacy that was close to our house, and we'd go there. And they had, you know, you'd go to the counter, and they had right below the counter there, they had ma a magazine rack, and they had all these porn magazines, you know, Playboy and all these things. They were right there, right in front. And so you know, we had four little kids, you know, and uh, Lise, bless her soul, you know, she, she, where's the pharmacist? And she brought him over and she said, I have four children that come here and pick up things for me. And she said, you've put this thing right here in front of them. I said, I'm not telling you, you have the right to sell what you want to sell, but you have to put this right here. You know? And he kind of blew her off and said, well, you know, if you don't like it, you know, and she said, fine. She said, I will never step foot in this pharmacy again if that's what you want. Fine, you know. Well, you know, a couple of weeks went by and uh, I happened to go in to get something, you know, and looked around and sure enough, you know, those magazines, they were still in the store, but they were in the back of the store with the other stuff, you know, and the people who were consuming that product, they knew where it was, they knew where to get it if they needed it, but it wasn't fully exposed to our children and ourselves, you know. My only point was, sometimes you just got to step up and you know, confront something which is, which is evil. You know? uh, and then finally, uh, God is a patient teacher. Amen to that in my life, surely in your life, right? Abram had a lot of lessons to learn in order to become the man that God wanted him to be as the father of the Jewish nation and the type, he's the type for all Christians who would be saved by faith. And so even though he failed in Egypt, and now he succeeded in this battle and would later fail again several times in his life, God was a patient teacher in bringing him to full maturity. So God has an image of each one of us as well because, and here's the punchline for our whole lesson, we are the types. We're the types for, for faith, for courage, for perseverance, for purity, we're the types for our children and our grandchildren and our brethren and our neighbors and our coworkers and so on. We're the types because uh, you know, it's an old story. You know, people may not read the Bible, but they read you. you know, they read you and I. So God is patient to teach us all of our lessons until we, like Abraham, reach our full potential and our perfection in Jesus Christ. He's a lot more. He is normally more patient with us than we are with us. You know, I lose patience with myself a lot faster than God will lose patience. All right, so that's the story on Melchizedek. That's it for this time.